This is the ultimate iceberg for the creepiest crimes committed in Japan, starting with the surface level crimes and going all the way down to the crimes history has forgotten about. First, the Tsuyama Massacre. May 21st, 1938. It's 1.40 in the morning in a remote Japanese village of maybe 100 people. Everyone's deep asleep when all of a sudden, screams and gunshots pierce the air. What happens over the next five-ish hours would become known as the largest non-war killing in modern-day Japan. Toi Mutsuo, who had failed the military draft entrance examination due to early onset symptoms of tuberculosis, became ostracized and isolated by his town when women he dated began to spread the rumors of his diagnosis. Well, tuberculosis was a very contagious disease, so nobody wanted to be around someone even if they were just rumored to have it. In response to this increased isolation, Mutsuo obtained a hunting license, purchased firearms, and began practicing his shooting in the mountains. He also started prowling the streets at night, probably to intimidate people. One night, his prowling turned deadly. On May 21st, 1938, Mutsuo dressed all in black, equipped himself with a sword, some knives, and a modified shotgun, and beginning with his grandmother, proceeded to kill everyone he could find in the town. In the end, he murdered 30 people, including his own grandmother and a child as young as five years old. When it was over, Mitsuo left a letter for his sister, headed to the mountains, and took his own life. In the note, he expressed regret mostly for killing his grandmother, said that he wanted to be reborn stronger, and apologized to his sister who would be left to handle the aftermath. But no apology could make up for the devastation this man caused. Whole families were wiped out. The village would never be the same again. And that's just one of the surface level cases. As we get further down the iceberg, we're going to see things like a girl killing out of curiosity and the dangers of online dating. Next, the Hikari City murder case. In 1999, a depraved 18-year-old had the sick idea of going door to door disguised as a handyman while looking for housewives home alone. After knocking on a few doors, he entered a home under the guise of work and an encounter with the woman who was home quickly turned violent, ending in the woman's death. But if that wasn't bad enough, the situation gets worse, because the woman was not home alone. Her 11-month-old baby was there too. Naturally, this commotion caused the baby to start crying, and the murderer took his life as well. The perpetrator was quickly found, and his interrogation revealed some extremely disturbing things about his mental state, and there was an almost indifference to what he had done. When asked about the baby, he said, I wasn't trying to kill the infant, I just tied a bow around its neck to get it to stop crying. He also claimed that the reason he proceeded to sexually assault the woman after her death was because he'd read in the novel Makai Tensho that this was a ritual of resurrection. The boy, known as Juvenile F, was originally sentenced to life in prison, but the sentence was overturned and changed to the death penalty. Now, despite the horror of his crimes, the decision to sentence this kid to death was a huge point of controversy in Japan at the time. And you might think, but he was an adult. But at the time, in Japan, a person wasn't considered an adult until they were 20 years old. And so, it, according to their legal system, he was still a minor. 18 was old enough for him to assault and murder this woman and her child. And so 18 was old enough for him to pay for his crimes. Next, we have the murderer who killed out of curiosity. In 2014, a 16-year-old girl we'll call Heather was showing some disturbing signs. On top of emotional outbursts, she also enjoyed killing cats and had once attempted to murder her own father with a baseball bat in his sleep. The family, instead of reporting her, decided to get Heather an apartment in the city away from them and sent her to live on her own. This, naturally, was the worst thing they could have done. One day, Heather invited a classmate, Aiwa Mitsuo, to her apartment under the guise of hanging out together. 
Iowa, also 16, had a promising future. All accounts described her as friendly, unsuspecting, trusting. She could have never known that her decision to spend time with a classmate would lead to her death. Now before all of this, Heather had admitted to her stepmother that she was curious about killing people. On July 26th, Iowa arrived at Heather's and walked right into a trap. She was attacked from behind with a hammer and then strangled to death. This murder was not an accident, it was premeditated. There was no animosity between Iowa and Heather. Heather just wanted to find out what it would be like to kill someone and dissect their body. Naturally, when Iowa didn't return from her friend's house, her mother called the cops. And the police arrived on the very next day, July 27th, to find Iowa's body dismembered at Heather's apartment. Heather, who wasn't actually there at the time, was found nearby and originally claimed to not know Iowa. Now, I don't know what plan she had with that, like, oh, somebody came into my apartment, murdered someone, and left her there. But eventually, she did admit to the murder. Heather was sent to a juvenile school for treatment, and her father ended up taking his own life, saying he didn't think he deserved to live. Now, I don't know about all that, but the choice to send your 16-year-old daughter to live on her own instead of getting her the help that she needs, that was certainly a choice. Next, the Nagasaki stalker murder case. In 2010, a man and a woman met through a Japanese dating app and they began a relationship very quickly. The speed with which they moved from chatting online to moving in together was a little bit alarming to at least to the woman's family. But it seemed to her like it was the beginning of a great romance. You know, they all start the same, right? Boy meets girl, boy falls in love with girl, boy moves in with girl, happily ever after, right? Unfortunately, in this case, wrong. This love story took a pretty dark turn. The man, Gota Tsutsui, was initially very charming and attentive. That's what she fell for in the beginning. But as time went on, he became increasingly controlling and even abusive. He imposed strict rules on her, he limited her freedom, isolated her from her family, and here's a note for everyone. If you're dating someone and they pull you away from the people who are your support system, red flag. But if the emotional, the mental abuse wasn't enough, he also began to physically abuse her. For even the most minor things. By October of 2011, the situation had escalated to the point where the woman's family had begun noticing alarming changes in their daughter's behavior, suspected the abuse, and so they stepped in with police assistance. She was taken away from the place where they lived together and brought back to her family home. Sounds like a happy ending to a pretty twisted story, right? Again, unfortunately, wrong. Despite their separation, Tsutsui's obsession did not end there. He began to harass her and her family, sending threatening messages, and eventually he figured out where she lived. On December 16, 2011, Tsutsui broke into the family home and murdered the woman's 77-year-old grandmother and 56-year-old mother before fleeing the scene. He was found pretty quickly, and thanks to DNA evidence and all of the other facts of the case, of this twisted love story, he was charged and sentenced to death. Not all online dating ends badly, but this is a good reminder to be careful online. Even, even if you live together for almost a year, you never really know someone. Next, we have one of the most infamous unsolved cases in Japan to this day, the case of the Wednesday Strangler. Over the course of 14 years, several women disappeared and were later found their bodies were later found, and they were all linked by one pretty interesting pattern. They all, except for one, disappeared on a Wednesday. Between 1975 and 1989, seven women disappeared and were later found dead, all but one of them disappearing on a Wednesday. Five out of the seven deaths were caused by strangulation, and the other two also could have been caused by strangulation, but the cause of death was not determined because of the state of the remains. Other than Wednesdays, other than the strangling, there didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason behind the choice of victims. 
Their ages ranged from 11 to 50 years old. Their professions were different. Their locations were different. Three of the victims, or three of the bodies, were later found having been dropped from a cliff in Kitagata Cho. And this was later dubbed the Kitagata Affair. While a suspect was indicted in this, the three that were found, he was acquitted due to insufficient evidence. And even the police admitted to not doing a great job having over interrogated him and maybe given away too much information. These factors, along with the statute of limitations expiring, meant that these cases were never solved. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not convinced that all of these crimes were committed by the same perpetrator. How solid of an MO is disappearances on Wednesdays when it spans 14 years? And also, how difficult would that be for a copycat to be like, oh, well, if I take this girl on Wednesday, they'll just think it's the Wednesday Strangler and they'll keep chasing down those leads. I'm not saying, but I'm not not saying it. The motive of this next one is a bit different. The Tsuchiuda serial murder case began when a man decided he was done with life and that he wanted to die via the death penalty. So he set off on a murderous spree in the attempts to get caught and put to death. In 2008, a 24 year old man that we'll call Ken had had enough of life. He had enough of academic struggles, joblessness, and just this isolation that he felt. Up to this point, Ken would escape into video games as a way to dissociate from his depression, from his suicidal thoughts. I also dissociate into video games, so let's not, let's not do the video game crime link, okay? Eventually, he got it into his head that he wanted to die, but it had to be by the death penalty. And so he began to look for victims. Initially, Ken considered targeting a school. That would do it. But there were too many adults around, so he thought better of it. Instead, he went and stabbed an elderly man, and this would be the first of his violent crimes. Continuing his spree in Tokyo and driven by this desperate need for recognition on top of his obvious death wish, he stabbed multiple people in Arakawaoki Station, which resulted in two deaths and several serious injuries. Eventually, he turned himself in, hoping to fulfill his death wish. During the trial, it was revealed that Ken had NPD. Now, if you don't know what NPD is, congratulations, you must have been fortunate to not grow up with or date a narcissist in your life. NPD is Narcissistic Personality Disorder. Despite this diagnosis, though, he was found mentally stable, able to accept responsibility for his crimes, and was given the death penalty that he had so badly wanted. Naturally, he accepted it without appeal. Next, we're talking about another unsolved case. One that had Japan divided about whether a powerful man had been murdered or decided to take his own life after death threats and too much pressure. In 1949, Sadanori Shimoyama, the first president of the Japanese National Railways, was found dead under mysterious circumstances. On July 4th, 1949, Shimoyama had released a list of about 30,000 railway employees that were to be fired in the name of personnel cutbacks. I'm sure a lot of us have felt something like what those employees were feeling, especially around the pandemic recently, uh, and some of you maybe post-pandemic. Uh, it's not fun. So maybe it's not a surprise to learn that as a result of this announcement and these cutbacks, Shimoyama received a lot of death threats, even from high-level US military officials. The next day, July 5th, Shimoyama left his home around 8.20 in the morning. He instructed his driver to stop at a department store, and that department store was the last place he was seen alive at 9.37 a.m. A little past midnight, his body was found dismembered on the railway between two stations. It was determined, and perhaps obviously, that he was hit by a train. But autopsy findings suggested that he may have already been dead when he was hit by the train. He had internal bleeding from the impact, but there was a lot of blood loss that did not seem to be related to the place 
where he was hit by the train. This whole thing sparked a lot of conspiracy theories. Some suggesting that US military was involved, maybe in an attempt to weaken the Communist Party. Others suggested poetic justice by those harmed by Shimoyama's budget cuts. And others thought that the pressure was just too much and he took his own life. Because of limited forensic capabilities at the time, investigators had a lot of trouble coming to a conclusion. And the fact that their findings were never revealed to the public gave some merit to the various conspiracies. If the police aren't telling us what's going on, why? Guess we'll never know. Next, we'll head to Kobe, where a school janitor discovered a boy's severed head outside of the school gates before classes began. In his mouth was a note. The perpetrator of this crime, sometimes considered to be a Zodiac Killer copycat, was only 14 years old. In 1997, Japan was rocked by this case involving a series of brutal killings perpetrated by a young boy. His actions led to the deaths of two children and serious injuries for several others, leaving the whole city reeling. In February of 97, the boy attacked two girls on their way home from school, seriously injuring one of them who was only 10 years old. This incident went relatively unnoticed despite the violence of the crime and the age of everyone involved. In March of the same year, he killed a girl with a hammer and seriously injured another. In May, the situation escalated when the killer murdered an 11-year-old boy, beheaded him, and left his severed head in front of the school gate with a note tucked into his mouth. The note said, This is the beginning of the game. Try to stop me if you can, you stupid police. I desperately want to see people die. It is a thrill for me to commit murder. A bloody judgment is needed for my years of great bitterness. Finally, in June, the killer was arrested. It was then that it was revealed that he was only 14 years old. He was placed in a juvenile medical training school, but was released on parole in 2004 after serving only six years. As expected, this caused some outrage. The people of Kobe, especially the families of the victims, did not think this boy had been rehabilitated in six years when he was murdering people at the age of 14. But there's a lot of controversy, or at least there was a lot of controversy around this case. Some claimed that the boy who was charged with these murders was not the actual killer, citing that the killer was left-handed but the boy was right-handed. Others say that the boy was not intelligent and the letter that he had written spoke of some eloquence that they didn't think he was capable of. Despite the questions as to whether or not he was the actual killer, the boy, then a man, released a book in 2015, an autobiography, that seemed to maybe express some regret for what he had done, but also recounted his crimes in graphic detail. The family of one of the murdered children tried to stop the book from being published, and they were unsuccessful. And the book actually went on to become a bestseller in Japan. The killer then proceeded to create a vanity website where he would post photoshopped nudes of himself, and there was just some unhinged behavior that seemed to point that maybe he wasn't ready to be released from this detention facility. Maybe he should have never been released. As a result of all of this, or maybe in retaliation for all of this, for the book being published, despite ethical concerns of that, for this strange behavior online, a tabloid actually released his name, his real name, his location, his occupation. Despite all of this, despite his name, his location, everything being released to the public, that seems to be where the story ends. Nothing seems to come of it after that. He, he faded from the public eye, again, and presumably went on to live a normal life while the families of his victims can't walk into a bookstore in Japan without seeing the proof, the reminder 
of his release and his freedom. These were the surface level cases, but let's go down below the surface for the next ones. We're starting with the Nishinomiya mummification incident. This is another cautionary tale about online dating, about how you never really know who's on the other side of the screen. In 2013, a man named Ueda met this woman A through an online dating app, and they hit it off really quickly. They started bonding over shared interests, shared life experiences. Ueda had been struggling financially, not doing so well, and so he pretended to be a nurse like A, so they would have one more shared experience, one more thing that they had in common, one more connection. Through all of this talking and, and you know, getting along really well, he talked her into meeting him in Osaka. Now, when A got there, she knew something was up. Something wasn't quite right. And eventually, Ueda came clean about his job, his lack of job. Somehow, this confession and the resulting conversation escalated into an argument over the meaning of happiness. Ueda said that happiness to him is family. A said to her, happiness includes money. And there's no shame in that. Success is important to people. Sometimes success means money to people. Differences of opinion, differences of values, that could mean you're not compatible, but that should be where it ends. It shouldn't escalate to murder. But for whatever reason, this difference in opinion triggered Ueda to the point where he strangled her to death. The weird part about this, I mean, all, all of it's weird, but he just went about his life. He, he did steal money from her. He took her ATM card and he took money out of the bank, but he continued to go on dates with another woman and just kind of lived his life for a few days before dumping her body in a forest. A's body was found three months later, mummified, and all of this unraveled once more. Ueda was arrested, and during the trial, he said that he didn't mean to kill her, and he wasn't trying to steal from her, and the judge saw right through it. I mean, he probably didn't set out to kill her, but the judge said the fact that you took her money kind of counters this whole theft thing, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Once again, this is another case that reminds us of the dangers of online dating, and there are dangers in all kinds of dating but just be careful out there. For this next one, we're traveling to Fukuoka City for a disturbing plot that unfolded involving exchange students, what they thought was going to be a big payout and the tragedy that it became. In 2003, Fukuoka City became the stage for a <sighs> crime where three broke exchange students lured by the sight of a luxury car, planned a robbery. Their target was a 41-year-old clothing retailer after they saw a Mercedes-Benz out in their driveway and thought, wow, there must be so much money inside. Let's go get it. Leading up to the crime, it seemed these students were obsessing over this family's wealth. They saw the car in the driveway and planned this robbery. And while maybe they weren't originally including murder as part of their plan, it was kind of agreed upon that it was a whatever-it-takes situation. The students broke into the house via an unlocked window and found the wife in the bathtub, where they drowned her. They then moved on to the children's room, suffocating the son who was asleep on the bottom bunk, and taking the daughter hostage. The husband, who hadn't been home at the time, returned and was coerced into revealing his PIN for his bank account. Despite begging for their lives, the students ended up murdering both him and his daughter. They weighed down the bodies with dumbbells and dumped them in the sea. The whole sordid ordeal was finally revealed when a human leg was found floating in the water. Two of the students were found in China, and the last one was caught in Japan. All three were sentenced to death. This case is a reminder that sometimes greed has no limits. Next, we're diving into a case about unchecked jealousy. 
In a shocking twist, a Saitama police sergeant turned criminal, engaging in a robbery and murder over financial woes related to a secret affair. In 2015, a Saitama prefecture police sergeant, burdened with financial problems that seemed to be a result from an extramarital affair, embarked on a desperate mission turned deadly. On September 3rd, 2015, the Sergeant X was doing an autopsy for a resident's father. I didn't know that was something that police sergeants did, but while he was there, he discovered a safe. The sergeant meticulously planned this robbery, and so after casing the house and learning the resident's schedule, he entered the next day used ethanol and strangled the resident before making off with over a million yen in cash and also some valuable coins. The resident was found with no signs of resistance, but the sergeant's DNA was found at the scene. On top of this, eyewitnesses saw the car, the guy's car, in the area. The sergeant ended up receiving a life sentence for the crime after he told the jury at his trial that he decided to murder the man because he thought it would be too difficult to just rob him. This isn't the first case that blurs the line between protector and perpetrator, and I don't need to get into all that, but those were the below the surface crimes, but I want us to go into deeper waters here, starting with the case of Johnny Kitagawa. If you haven't heard of Kitagawa, he's what they call the Harvey Weinstein of Japan. Kitagawa was accused of assaulting hundreds of young boys through his time as a top talent agent in Japan. It was known that he could make or break a career and some victims said that if you wanted to be successful, you had to put up with the abuse. It was necessary to succeed. Kitagawa's company was often dubbed the boy band factory and I don't know how much you know about the J-pop or K-pop industries, but these industries are churning out groups that they are essentially selling as a product rather than human beings. The industry as a whole has a, there's a lot to unpack there, but Kitagawa's company was known for very strict control over its idols and its trainees. It's assumed that the abuse began in the 1960s with the first generation of Johnnies. But Kitagawa also had an immense level of power over the media and so a lot of these things were silenced there were victims that tried to come forward and it was just brushed under the rug victims said that kitagawa had a habit of preying on trainees that were around 15 years old he would move from one boy to another in the dormitory i'm not going to go through the details of all of these reports from victims they're as awful as you can imagine what i do want to mention is that a lot of people blame Japan's culture of shame around things like sexual assault and sexual violence. And it's not just sexual violence, it also extends to things like mental health. People blame this silence on the part of Japan and the Japanese culture for the reason that Kitagawa never was punished for his crimes. Even today, people are still coming forward as they gain courage to speak out about what they went through. Some victims, even now, say they feel like they owed him for making their careers. Next, we're going to Tokyo University, where a dental specialist's web of romantic affairs led to a poisoning in 1950, an assistant professor at the University of Tokyo was on the way to a celebratory event and became the target of a poisoning attack. The perpetrator, a dentist with a history of complicated romantic affairs, wanted to silence the professor who had threatened to expose his affairs. Seems a little extreme, but the dentist's personal life was in shambles. He had very bad luck with women, including several affairs, an arranged marriage. The assistant professor had been threatening to expose all of this, all of, all of his misdeeds. So the dentist came up with a plot to poison the professor. He laced a bottle of whiskey with cyanide, 
and gifted it to the professor who drank it and quickly fell ill and died. Originally, the death was deemed a heart attack, but another professor who was like a favorite student of the victim urged them to do a deeper investigation, and that's when they found the cyanide in the whiskey bottle. The dentist confessed to the crime, told all about how the professor was going to expose him, and he was originally sentenced to life in prison, but was reduced to 15 years. At the end, he only actually served eight years because he was a model prisoner. And when he was released, he started a new dental practice under a new name. So I guess that's a thing that we just, we can just do. The next case challenges our understanding of justice or the justice system. The Hiratsuka apartment five bodies case is another twisted one that includes disappearances, a mysterious string of deaths, and suspected incest. In 1984, six-year-old T was reported missing, with his mother alleging that he was abducted by North Korea. But in 2006, five bodies, including T's, were discovered in an apartment in Hiratsuka. Two of the bodies, one belonging to Y, who was 35, and one belonging to R, who was 19, were half-siblings. And originally, it was believed that they participated in a suicide act and were in an incestual relationship. However, there was a note found from the mother that admitted to murdering her daughter, R. And then there was another note found from Y who expressed wanting to die to be with R. R had last been seen in October of 2005 when her social media posts had stopped. And later they found some concerning text messages that were talking about her annoyance with her mother and a need for freedom. The mother was arrested for murder and Y's death was ruled a suicide, but the mother faced no trial for T or the infants due to the statute of limitations. In the end, the mother only received a 17-year prison sentence, despite being responsible for five murders. Next, we're talking about the Mazda dormitory incident. In this one, a young man's hard-earned savings become the motive for his brutal murder by a co-worker and former classmate. In 2016, a shocking crime was committed in the Mazda dormitory. A 20-year-old employee consumed by jealousy and financial recklessness brutally assaulted and killed his 19-year-old colleague who had saved over a million yen to buy a used car. The victim was a well-liked employee known for his discipline and the assailant had a gambling problem. <laughs> Overwhelmed with jealousy by, I guess, this man's money or maybe just his willpower and self-discipline, um, the assailant used a fire extinguisher and his fists to brutally attack the victim. Afterwards, he withdrew about 1.2 million yen from the victim's account and stole his cell phone. I don't know why people think they get, they'll get away with these crimes when they involve stealing money from like an ATM in 2016. Like, we're gonna see you. It's, anyway. Remarkably, the assailant returned to finish his night shift at work to try to present an air of normalcy. Unsurprisingly, the crime was discovered because of surveillance footage. He was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. So remember that when you want to steal from your friends who have more money than you, you will get caught and never get to spend that money. Keep it in mind. Those were the deeper waters, but now we're going really deep down into the abyss. And we're starting with the Kita Kyushu confinement murder case. This one is a story about manipulation, confinement, torture, where a man's twisted games led to the deaths of seven people, including an entire family. Between 1996 and 2002 in Kitakyushu City, a series of crimes was orchestrated by a man, M, and his wife, B. 
The man was a master manipulator. He used psychological torture and physical abuse to control and eventually kill several victims, including his wife's family. The man drew his wife into a violent relationship, one that led to her attempting suicide. But he manipulated a lot of people, not just his wife. He exploited people's vulnerabilities, made them question the people they trusted. He managed to incite abuse and killings among his victims. The man and his wife extorted over 40 million yen from his wife's family, manipulating them through fabricated crimes and demands. And this continuous abuse of the victims resulted in multiple deaths, including his wife's parents and sister. This man's cruelty included stunting children's growth through dietary restrictions and sleep deprivation. One of the victims, a man and his young daughter, came to live with M and his wife after M convinced him to separate from his wife. So the man and the daughter moved in with this couple. The man, after not even a year and a half of this torture, ended up dying. The daughter was eight years old when they started living there, and she was 17 when she managed to escape and get help. Both the man and the woman were arrested, and during the trial, the wife admitted to the crimes, but the man denied them the whole time. Initially, they were both sentenced to death, but the wife ended up having her sentence reduced to life in prison, considering she was also a victim. It's scary to think about the amount of time these crimes remained behind closed doors. Seven people in total died from the manipulation and abuse carried out by this man and his wife. Next, in the Nishitetsu bus hijacking incident, a teenager's feelings of inferiority and a history of bullying turn what should have been just a regular bus ride into a tragic accident. Well, into a tragic death. In the year 2000, a 17-year-old boy known as A hijacked a Nishitetsu bus. On May 3rd, 2000, A hijacked the bus and deviated its normal route. He threatened the driver and the passengers and instructed them to close all curtains and then he assaulted three of them. When A hijacked the bus, he announced to the passengers that they were not going to heaven, but to hell. And that may not make sense, but the bus was headed to Tenjin, and the kanji for Tenjin means heaven and God. So I guess he thought he was funny. Luckily, one of the passengers escaped and alerted police, and a pursuit ensued that ended in a standoff. At the standoff, A's parents were there. They tried to persuade him to stop what he was doing. During the hijacking, an elderly woman lost her life, which made it the first hostage death in a Japanese bus hijacking. After what ended up being more than a 15-hour ordeal, A was arrested. A's motivation apparently was attributed to this bullying in his childhood and also domestic violence at home. I don't know that it was ever explained how one led to another and what the bus had to do with it, but A was sent to a medical juvenile reformatory, which I'm learning is just what Japan calls juvie, <laughs> or rather when they think maybe when they think mental illness is involved. This whole incident led to Japan implementing anti-hijacking measures on buses and also led to the Hiroshima police creating uh, a hostage rescue team. Next, we're moving on to an incident with a demon bear. Not really, but we are talking about the Onikuma incident, which Onikuma means demon bear. So in this case, it's a moniker for a man who discovered infidelity and went on a murder spree. In 1926, Kumajira Iwabuchi, a cart puller nicknamed Onikuma, or Demon Bear, embarked on a path of destruction fueled by jealousy. 
and betrayal. This seems to be a theme. He discovered that his lover had other lovers and this led him on a violent rampage. He killed her, a shop owner, injured a police officer, and set off a huge manhunt involving 50,000 people. Kumajiro was known for his heavy drinking and kind of rough disposition. He was married with five children, but had extramarital affairs. Now, I just want you to think about that for a second. So the killer was married and was having affairs, but when he found out the woman he was having an affair with was also having affairs, he went on a murderous rampage. Just let that sink in. After learning of his lover's infidelity, Kumajiro beat and killed her. He then murdered the owner of the shop where she worked, and I don't know if that's who she was sleeping with, but on his way out from that, he injured a police officer. There were extensive efforts to capture him, but Kumajiro knew the area so well that he easily evaded arrest. And in the end, instead of risking being caught and having to be punished for his crimes, he took his own life, hanging himself in front of a journalist. Gotta make sure that story gets out. Those who aided Kumajira during his time as a fugitive were tried, but they were kind of given pretty easy sentences. And despite his actions, he was not really condemned by his village. Like, I guess this is just what's expected when you cheat and the person you're cheating with is also cheating. I don't... Double standard? Can we say double standard? Next, we have a case of wrongful conviction. In the Hirosaki incident, the murder of a university professor's wife led to the arrest and conviction of an innocent man. In 1949, in Hirosaki City, a medical university professor's wife was brutally stabbed to death. The assailant entered the residence while the husband was away, and the crime led to the arrest of Takashi Nasu, who was a local unemployed man, but he wasn't the perpetrator. Nasu didn't have a solid alibi, and he had blood on his shirt, which might have been the victim's blood type so he was arrested and convicted. After a trial that focused heavily on this questionable blood evidence, Nasu was sentenced to 15 years in prison in 1952. In 1971, however, Takuya Fukamatsu confessed to the murder, revealing details that matched the evidence. Following the confession, Nasu was exonerated in 1977, but that wasn't the end of his legal battles. The actual murderer was later arrested in 1984 for indecent acts against three junior high school girls. The initial blood type identified on Nasu ended up not even being linked to the victim at all. Nasu filed a state compensation lawsuit due to his wrongful conviction and imprisonment, but ended up losing. For the next case, we're heading back to Fukuoka for the beautician dismemberment murder case. In this one, a 38-year-old woman, fueled by jealousy, once again, kind of a theme here, ends up gruesomely dismembering her younger female lover. In 1994, Fumiko Eda, a married mother of two working at a popular hair salon in Fukuoka City, suspected her lover, Eiichi, of having an affair with another beautician, Mayumi Iwasaki. She was already trapped in a troubled marriage and had begun an affair with Eiichi, which intensified after the two took a trip to Hawaii. But her unfounded suspicions of Eiichi's infidelity with Mayumi just kept leading to worsening jealousy. She was overcome by rage. Again, no evidence of any affair going on. I want to make that clear. She was convinced. She was convinced that this was happening, and so the only solution in her mind was to get rid of the problem. The problem in this case being Mayumi. So Fumiko killed Mayumi, dismembered her body, and then scattered the dismembered parts in various locations, including a highway trash bin and a train station locker. 
Initially, the brutality of this crime led investigators to suspect a male perpetrator, as you do. The breakthrough, though, came from Fumiko herself because she had kept a diary. When will they learn? <laughs> Fumiko's diary played a crucial role in solving the case, but at the trial, she never admitted to the murder. She did admit to dismembering the body. Fumiko was sentenced to 16 years in prison, and while she sat in prison, she wrote a memoir, which still did not admit to the murder. Is it possible that she wasn't the perpetrator? I don't think so. I don't think so. But I don't know what it was that her diary said, but if they said it led to her, then I believe them. I hope you enjoyed this unsettling yet enlightening deep dive into Japan's creepy crime history. I know we covered a lot today from the absolutely horrific to the ridiculous, but if you're still here, thanks for watching. Hopefully we'll see you next time. And in the meantime, stay safe, stay curious. Bye-bye.